Praise God. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank the ladies. Ladies, thank you so much for allowing us to uh, go to this retreat. And I pray and I promise that some of your men are going to come back changed. They're going to come back on fire. Just like you guys came back on fire and you're still on fire. Although I think you ladies are always on fire. So we thank you. We thank you for working so hard. We thank you for the help you've given us to, uh, to bring this together. It's hard for men to, uh, it's like hurting cats. So thank you. Thank you so much. If you're here for the first time, please, please come back. Don't judge our service by this um, service. Come back and uh, I think we're better live. Um, as a matter of fact, even as I'm doing this, I... I'm asking John and those that are here to pray because um, I find it kind of awkward filming this. And uh, But I wanted to be with you and I want to tell you uh, that we love you. And if you're here for the first time, come back. Come back a bunch of times. We like to say that we're a bunch of nobodies trying to tell anybody about somebody. And that somebody's Jesus. We've been talking about what to do series. Right? We've been doing a what to do series. What do you do? What do you do? We talked about what do you do when the lights go out. And we talked about sometimes, and we're, we're living in perilous times. And we've talked about what do you do when that darkness comes in, when you feel oppressed, when uh, things go bump in the night in the recesses of your soul, and it's hard to stand when you don't understand. What do you do? What do you do when you feel like, like you've done everything and you studied and you've prayed up and stayed up and stored up and you're faithful, you come to church and what do you do when these things go bad and, 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 and you don't know where else to turn? We talked about that faith is better developed in the dark. Faith is like film. What do you do when the lights go out? And My goodness, that was a blessing. And then we went on to um, what do you do when... You, the, when your nest is stirred, and if you were here for that, we were talking about how the mama eagle stirs the nest, and and at one point she takes her wing, she takes her wing and throws the nest off the cliff, and so that the the little eaglets are on the cliff, and the father eagle comes and and rides and starts to puts one on his back and rides, and and while they're flying high above the canyon. He swoops and the little baby eagle is falling. And we talked about that, my goodness, that, that first experience when you're falling and you, you see nothing but the ground come up and, and you feel like the world is, is coming against you and you're about ready to uh, call it curtains. He comes and swoops. And we, talk, we said that you cannot fall faster than your father can fly. You cannot fall faster than your father can swoop. Can I get an amen? And I promise you that's the truth. Then last week we talked about what do you do when, when your wine runs out. And we talked about Jesus and, and the wedding at Cana. Today I want to bring what do you do when in your time of need. What do you do in your time of need? And, and if, my goodness, if we go into the word and, and this is our, this is Basic instructions before leaving the earth. The human being's owner's manual. And we're going to see that Jesus looked to his father in his time of need. It's funny how we sometimes, we call to God, we, we pray to God, we, we, we profess God, but we act as if he, that he isn't there. And when we Christians, when you and I tap into that resource, when we start to understand who we are in Christ, when we start to understand and start tapping into this, this blue representing men, red God, we start tapping into that He is in us. He is our hope of glory. Our lives will change. Amen? One, Jesus looked to His Father in His time of need. 1 John 2, 6 says this, He who says He abides in Him ought Himself to walk just as he walked. In other words, beloved, we're doers of the word. Don't expect God to direct your path unless you're willing to move your feet. It's not just professing. It's not just... The, remember, for as many as receive him to them, he gives the power to become his children. After you receive him as your savior, you start walking in his walk. You start... It's not just a matter of saying that you're a Christian. We need to... The Bible says, put on the mind of Christ. We need to act and live as Christians. 
Psalms 28, 7 says this. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices and with my song, I will praise him. I, I pray the men over there at the retreat right about right now, while you're watching this, we're praising God over there. And beloved, I want you to know that a heart that's filled with joy, a heart that's filled with the knowledge who, of who they are in Christ, a heart that has tapped into, tapped into this thing, a heart that's tapped into this Christ in them will rejoice. I pray that in your worship time, and, and my goodness, uh, there's some from our worship team that couldn't be here today because they're with us, but we have an incredible worship. We have different teams, and I don't know which team was up here today, but I promise you they ushered you into worship. And by the way, it's not by feeling. You don't come in and say, oh my goodness, that was a song that I liked, this. No, you come in knowing that you're, you're entering into the very presence of God. What you should have been doing by yourself at home, worshiping God in your prayer time in your closet as you go throughout the day. We collectively, every Sunday, come together. And my goodness, I exalt thee and we sing all the songs. And no matter how, if the music is bad, if they're off key, if the person next to you is talking, you go before the throne of God and you worship him. You worship him because he's worthy of worship. You worship him because he's the only one worthy of worship. There is no name given to men where men may be saved other than the man Jesus. Amen? Amen. Praise God. The will of God was carried out completely, victoriously, and courageously throughout the life of Jesus. You, you, you want to find out how to live a victorious life? You want to find out how to live a... A, a, a life filled not only with victory, with passion, with love, with, with the Spirit of God, look to Jesus. This morning we're going to look at 13 ways that Jesus looked to his Father in his time of need. And, and I, would, I would venture to say that, if, beloved, if, if Jesus looked to his Father in his time of need, how much more you and I need to look to the Father, look to His Son, look to the Spirit, amen? Number one, if you're taking notes, when Jesus felt weak, He looked to His Father for strength. He looked to His Father for energy. He looked to His Father for power. And if I were to say, how many of you feel weak sometimes? I know I do. I know I do. Sometimes when you just feel like quitting, Sometimes when you just don't know what's going on, you feel like throwing in the towel. Psalms 28, 7 says this, The Lord is my strength and my shield. 28, 7, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him. And watch this now. And I am helped. Ask the Lord to strengthen you. Ask the Lord to encourage you. To empower you in whatever you find yourself doing. In whatever you find yourself battling. And when you do that, do it with all your might. Do everything you can in the flesh. Do everything you can in the blue, in the flesh. And leave the things that you can't handle. Because this is where we struggle. We say to God, I believe you, for I, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is God. I believe in my heart that he was raised from the dead, and I received him as my Savior. And when you receive him, he enters you. By the way, he never leaves you nor forsakes you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You become his son. For as many blue people that receive my red spirit, to them I give the power to become my children. Even to Conrad, who believed in his name. So when you receive Jesus, you are empowered. The problem is we don't tap into that power. We don't tap into that power. So we want to take everything and we want to do everything in the blue. Remember we talked about the other day about he maketh me lie down because I want to run ahead of him. I don't want to wait. Those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And in the flesh, we want to take care of business. We want to take it now. And man, we'll do whatever. We'll cheat. We'll steal. We'll lie. We'll do whatever because 
Although we profess Him and possess Him, we don't trust Him to take care of these things. And, 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 and I'm telling you, in those times of weakness, in those times that you're discouraged, in those times that it seems like it's over, do everything you can in the flesh. Do the work that you need to do. Be faithful at your job. Be faithful with your giving. Be faithful with your, with your walk with the Lord. And let Him take care of the things that you can't do. When Jesus felt discouraged, He turned to His Father for encouragement. I would imagine that Jesus remembered the words of David who wrote, My heart, watch this now, My heart leaps for joy, and I will thank I will give thanks to Him in song. Praise you, Jesus. I exalt Thee, I exalt Thee. This is why we sing those songs. Beloved, call on the Lord while He may be found. And I promise you that He will replace your feelings of discouragement with, with the joy of His encouragement. I tell people all the time, I said... Don't wait for the feeling to come to the altar. We don't walk by feeling. We walk by faith. And I promise you that most of the time, even though you don't feel like it, you come to the altar knowing you need that, that, that touch, that a presence. Understanding what's happening. Even though you don't feel it, you come to the altar. Nine out of ten times, you will leave with a feeling. Now, I'm not saying that when you do that, your, your problems, your, your financial problems, your, all these things are going to be taken care of. But you will tap into a resource that can take care of it, will give you the wisdom to better handle it, and at the very least, you will get the joy and the peace that passes all understanding in the midst of your circumstance. Praise God. Number three. When Jesus felt alone and forsaken, how many of us felt that? He cried, out, he cried out to his Father and received sweet assurance of companionship and guidance. I, I would imagine that he remembered the, the words of David who wrote, watch this now, you have made known to me the path of your life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Psalm 1611. That ministers to me, man. Ask the Lord to help you take advantage of that promise. When he said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you in James 4.8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's funny how we pray, Lord, give me, give me, give me. And he's up there saying, I've given you everything. I've given you my son. I've given you everything that is in my son. Who is your hope of glory? Tap into that. You draw near to him. He's already done everything for us. Number four. When Jesus felt that he needed wisdom and guidance, he sought his father's wisdom. Jesus knew that his father had promised. Jesus knew. Well, in Romans 11, 33, he says, Great depth and riches of wisdom. By the way, Jesus was wisdom. It's not that he had wisdom. It's that he was wisdom. God is wisdom. And I want you to know that it cost him something when he stepped down from his glory and emptied himself and took the form of a man. And he subjected himself to everything you and I would experience as humans. And then the Bible says, and sin not. And the life he lived qualify him to die the death he died that you and I might have eternal life. Man, somebody should be shouting right about here. Praise God. Seek the Lord's wisdom. Seek His knowledge. Ask Him to give you that wisdom to make the wisest decisions in every problem. Include God in all your problems. And put Him in your marriage. Put Him in the relationship with your children. Put Him at work. Don't work as if you're working for that boss. Work as if you're working for the Lord and your boss will be blessed by having you there at His 
job. Oh man, praise God. I would imagine that if we tapped into this, if even in this small congregation, fusion, by the way, God is doing a mighty work here. We, we get... Let's get, man, the guys are going to come back on fire. You ladies are on fire. There's going to be a firestorm in here. Revival might just break out here. And I pray it starts, I pray it starts with you ladies even before we come back. That we hear praise reports that this place is packed. That we would have to go outside or have, oh my goodness. God is doing a mighty work. Number five, when Jesus felt attacked. How many of you feel attacked? He called to his father's defense. He called to his father for defense. I would imagine that he remembered the words of David in Psalms 59.9 when he says, Oh my strength, I watch for you. You, oh God, are my fortress, my loving God. Ask the Lord to help you fight your battles. A couple of weeks ago, I don't remember the, the, which Sunday it was we did. What do you do when you face giants? And, and just as David faced his giant, you're facing your giants. And we said that your giants don't, don't prance up and down the valley of Elah. But they prance up and down at home, in your schools, at your jobs. They bring something down in the portals of your soul, in your rooms at night. You're facing giants of discouragement, of depression. You're facing giants of financial problems of, oh my goodness, beloved. Tap into this. Tap into this. Because just as the Holy Spirit led that rock to hit that giant of Gath, between the eyes, he will do the same to your giant. Praise God. When Jesus felt weary and faint hearted, he called to his Father for greater resources. I would imagine he remembered the words of David who wrote in Psalm 61 20 I call us my heart grows faint. I don't know about you, but that ministers to me. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against my foe. Beloved, ask the Lord to plug you into greater resources than you presently are tapped into. And he will renew and energize you. Number seven, when Jesus felt hated and despised and rejected by men. Been there, done that. And I'm sure some of you have too. He called to his father for reassurance. I remember when Jesus prayed in Luke 22, 42. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, your will, Dad. Take this cup away from me, but not my will. See, we want our will. We want our will. We want what we think is best. But I'm here to tell you that God knows best and better. He knows what we could use and He knows what we can really, really need. He knows not only what the desires of our heart, but He knows those desires that are lined up with His and those that are not. And if we were but to just follow the steps of our Lord and Savior, if we were to say, Lord, I didn't want this. I need this. I can really use this. Lord, help me with this. Lord, take care of Lord, but not my will. Let your will be done. And do everything we can in the flesh to accomplish and leave God the rest. Seek first the kingdom. 
and all those things will be taken care of. Seek first my righteousness. Seek first my spirit. Seek first my desires. Seek first my heart. Seek first my will. Seek first my word. And then all those material, flesh, mortal things that you need will be taken care of. And by the way, I, he, he's not talking, oh pastor, listen, if you're out there, if you're out there, oh pastor, he's not talking about greed. He's talking about need. We've gone way off, way off the topic on that one. Take time. Take time from your busy day to withdraw from maybe some of your, your shores. Take time during, ladies, take time during your days at work, when you're working, when you're cooking, even while you're doing that. And tap into this incredible resource. My father, my father. Delight and trust in the Lord for his reassurance. Even when men are hating you, even when, when your, your own husband has betrayed you or rejected you. When he's left you. And I'm speaking to the ladies because there's going to be mostly ladies here. My brothers, you too. You go through some things. We go through some things. How many of us, I would imagine that we can count on on one hand, those of us who have never been betrayed or by best friends, by friends, by even pastors, churches. And having said that, I want to say that if I've ever offended you, please forgive me. Please forgive me. God's not finished with me. Can I remind you that God will never leave you nor forsake you? Please know that he's your helper. And if God is for me, who can be against me? And, and here's something that's ministered to me in my, in my life. God has forgiven me more than... God has forgiven me having done more things than most other men or women have done. So who am I not to forgive, number one? Number two is, what can, let's say John, what can John do to me? What can John, what can anyone do to you or me that Christ has not already paid for? And if, you, and if, you, if that comes a reality in your life, I, I, you will have no problems forgiving. Number eight, when Jesus went into tremendous opposition, he called on his father to be greater than any problem. When Jesus ran into tremendous opposition, he called his father, who he knew was greater than any problem. Mark 9, 23, Jesus said, All things are possible to him who believes. Remember when he said, If you have the faith of a small mustard seed, you can say to that great mountain, that mountain of opposition, that mountain of sarcasm, that mountain of negativity, that mountain of, of, of pessimism, that mountain of... Move in the name of Jesus. Of criticism, of misunderstanding. Number nine, when Jesus faced sickness, he called to his father. I would imagine he remembered the words of David in Psalms 103 when he said, He forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases and redeems your life from the pit and crowns, crowns you with love and compassion. Can I tell you that God is more interested in this than in this? He wants to mold your spirit, man, into the image of his son. And whatever he has to allow, whatever he has to allow, he will allow. We live in a sin, disease infested, infested world, and it falls on the just and the unjust. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. 
The difference between us and those people out there is that they look like this. They're empty, still searching for something to fill that void. And we're filled with the Spirit of God. If somebody like this died, they would go to hell. Because in order to enter a red kingdom, you have to have a red filling. In other words, spiritual. For us many blue people that receive my red spirit. It's not just a matter of believing, it's receiving. So, sometimes God will even use what the world has brought upon us in disease, in sickness. Sometimes He allows those things so that our inner man, our inner woman can be strengthened. And like Job say, even though He slay me, even then will I trust Him. That He may use us in our sickness sometimes. That he may see, others may see somebody who who's doesn't believe and sees, hey, how can that person praise me in that condition? How can that person praise God in that condition? How can he still be faithful? How can she still be faithful to her God? And many like Job's wife come up to us and say, are you still holding on to your integrity? Why don't you curse your God and die? And he said, woman, you speak as if a foolish woman. God gives and God takes away. I'm going to trust Him in all circumstances. And, and many times when we come to that realization, we're healed. It reminds me of Nebuchadnezzar who failed to give God the glory for his kingdom and became insane in an instant. And seven years living in the, in the grass like an animal. His nails grew like eagle's talons. He ate like an ox. And one day while eating grass like, a, like an animal, he looked up and noticed there's something bigger. It's like that little eagle. Remember last week, a, a little eagle looked up and he saw his father flying right above him. He wasn't far. He had looked everywhere, saw the earth coming at him as he was falling, and yet hardly ever. One time he looked up and Nebuchadnezzar looked up and saw and he said, my God, there is a God up there. And was healed instantly. Trust God in everything. In everything. In everything. I want to, I want to remind you that God's real, beloved. God's real. And if you tap into that realness, your life will change. Number 10, when Jesus faced growing dissatisfaction among people, he cried to God for help. I remember that when I was writing this, Matthew 5 8 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they should be satisfied. Blessed are those who hunger. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul pants after you, my father. My heart will delight in your word. As every answer I have for life, for living, for whatever my anything that can come against me, it's, the answer is here. I just need to tap into it. I, we need to be more like Jesus when he faced the 5,000 hungry people in John 6, 11. Jesus said this, Jesus took the loaves the word says this, he took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed to those who were seated as much as they needed or wanted. And it doesn't even say needed, it said as much as they wanted. Because he will give you, see, I, I keep telling you, I have no problem saying that God wants to give you the desires of your heart if your heart desires him first. The Lord has plenty of resources available to those who will ask. Seek and you shall find. Not the door will be open. There's no limit in his resources. There's no limit. But then again, he knows there's hardly no limit in our evil. So a lot of times we ask amiss. Even with the best of intentions. It's like when a little kid says to you, Mommy, I want, and, and you know that that's bad for them. And sometimes you have to say no. Number 11. When Jesus faced oppression from unrighteous authorities. 
he trusts his father to intervene in his behalf. You, you remember the time when at the garden when they came to arrest him and Peter took on a knife and the, his followers wanted to uh, intervene. Listen to, and I'll, remi I'll remind you of what he said in Matthew 26. He says, Do you think I cannot call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 10,000 angels. In other words, do you think this is happening before, without my father's consent? Do you think this is like the, the devil snuck up behind my father and he's doing something to his son without my daddy knowing it? Do you think I'm falling and I'm about to hit that, that, that the ground? That, do you think my father's not hovering right above me? Do you think that this time when his little eagle is going to, it will hit the ground. It will hit the earth. And I can call on my father and he will not only swoop, he will send myriads of angels to swoop me. But it's for your benefit that I hit the ground this time. It is for your benefit to allow mortals, the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, to do to me those things that are unspeakable in the very presence of my father and his hosts. You not think you not think that my daddy, and even in my weakness, even in my weakness, in my flesh, when I said to my father, take, Father, take this cup away from me. I don't want to taste this poison. He just still gave me the strength to say, my father, because I know him. My goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Tap into that. Tap into that. That his father, even flying, hovering above his son, let him hit the ground. Because if he didn't hit the ground, you and I would. If he didn't hit the ground, you and I would. Be wise in what you ask for, beloved. Be wise in what you ask for. Number 12, when Jesus faced fear, he called to his father for courage. I would imagine he remembered Psalms 23, 4, When David wrote, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you're with me. It doesn't matter what man will do to me. I know my father's got my back. This is why I personally don't fear nothing. I don't fear nothing. The worst that man can do to me is what? Take my blue body? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It would just speed up my graduation. <clears throat> Let the Lord calm your fears. Take courage from Him and from His promises of victory to you. He says, Be, I have overcome the world. I have no fear. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In this world, there, there will be many tribulations, but I've overcome the world. I've overcome the world. Number 13, beloved, when Jesus faced death, he looked to his Father for overcoming power. Even in his last breath, even while dying in the hands of mortals gonna muck. Even in the midst of a humanity gone crazy. While 
hanging from the cross and looking at his very crucifiers when he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. In the, in the zenith of his pain, not only from morals, but that his father had turned his back. My father, why hast thou forsaken me? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said to his father, my father, this is faith. This is trust. This is intimacy. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And Luke 23, verse 46, says, and when he had said this, he breathed this last. You and I may not understand all that God has caused us to face. But I can promise you that if we obey Him, He assures us that He will bless us and use us to accomplish His work. Do you know Him? Do you know Him? I'm sure somebody right in a few minutes here will come up and, and give you an opportunity, give you an opportunity to answer this question. If you were to leave here today and God forbid you were to die, if your life was required, where would your spirit go? Can, can I tell you something? That, that you were created in the image of God in that all mortals, all humans are eternal. When God breathed into man, he breathed. He's the only creature that has the likeness of God. When he made Adam, he made him alive. When he brought Eve out of Adam, she was alive. Watch this now. Because she was taken from a living man, a God-filled man. She also had God in her. When Satan convinced her that she could be a God, that she needed, didn't need God anymore, and she disobeyed God and ate of that fruit, the spirit of the living God left her. She was a dead, spiritually dead, dying woman in front of a living man. He chose to be with his bride, and the spirit of God left him. Now they're both empty. Empty, dying, dead spiritually, and dying physically. They were cast out of the garden, and they started to procreate, have babies, but the babies they procreated were as spiritually dead as they are, or as they were. So that's what the Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. There is none one in the earth, there's none red filled, no, not one. There's none that has me in them. Four thousand years later, the Holy Spirit impregnated a young lady by the name of Mary, and nine months after that, from a blue woman, comes out another living creature, a living being, a man God, a God man. Who can explain such a thing? Walking amongst dead, spiritually dead, and sin-filled, dying mortals. He came down that we had the ability to go up. He died that we may have the only chance to live. Because this isn't life. The life that you and I live without Jesus is the valley of the shadow of death. Every day we're closer to death. Senescence, the poison of sin, runs through our body. This is why we lose our hair and get fat and wrinkly and get old. It's because death is creeping up. And since it was never meant to be here, it's taking its time. And, and, and the reason some of us are spared from it is because God is merciful and He wants us to receive Him. So he came and took the form of a man, walk among men, so that he can tell them, hey, listen, 
For as many blue men that receive my spirit, to them I give the power to become my children. Nicodemus came to God and says, how can I enter the kingdom? He says, you have to be born again. Nicodemus thinking like a natural man. How can I enter my mama's womb? I'm already old. Not from your mama. Not from mortals. Nicodemus from my papa. See, you can't get to a red God and a red heaven unless you have red in you. I'm the only one that can offer it. The Bible says in the book of Romans, if you confess with your mouth, that's blue, that Jesus is God. Believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead. You will be saved. So my question to you this morning, and by the way, God knew you would be here before your mama was even born. Divine appointment. If you were to die, if you were to leave here today, and God forbid something were to happen to you. Last week, a young man, 20-something years old, on a stupid, stupid, just acting stupid, on a stupid incident where he has, somebody almost hit his truck, chased a guy, ran over something, and got shot and killed. And I wonder, I didn't know him, I wonder where he went. If a, a drive-by gone bad, if your life is required, where will your spirit go? The Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, that you can know you have eternal life. All you have to do is confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and he will give you life and life eternal. By the way, beloved, not everybody who professes Christ possesses him. He says, I'm not you. I pray you do that. I pray if you do, I, I pray that next week you'll be here. Come next year. That we're gonna, Oh, we're going to get in the word next week. Come and be part of this. Come and join us. Come and show the man that you missed us. Don't forget Tuesday night we have service. But I'm going to ask somebody to come up and just lead you in a prayer of salvation. If you could just come up to the altar, come up. and As you're coming up, I'm going to ask somebody to come and lead you in a prayer of salvation. And all you have to say is something like this. Father, I confess with my mouth that I'm a sinner. I confess I'm a sinner. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus, your son, is God. He walked on earth among men. He was crucified. He was buried. And I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth. I believe in my heart. That three days later, he was raised from the dead. And right now, I receive Jesus as my Savior. Do that. Do that, and if you do, and if you did, come and tell me next Sunday. God bless you. God bless you. I love you. I want to meet you in person. Thank you. Thank you, guys, for your love and your faithfulness. Thank you for, for those who are here this morning. Thank you. I love you guys. Keep us in prayer. We're going to be traveling back this afternoon, and, and we'll see you Tuesday night. Don't forget Tuesday night. Oh, my goodness.